My name is Rafael Fernandez de Castro. I'm the director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Relations at the University of California, San Diego. And I'm very uh, pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, conversation with Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kounalakis uh, from California. She will talk to us about uh, the future of California-Mexico relations. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for being with us. Uh, this is wonderful for the University of California system to host you uh, in this webinar. Uh, my colleague, uh, Stefano Bertossi, and I, we have been putting together this series of webinars uh, to have conversations between Mexicans and Americans uh, within these uh, emergency situations. So it's very, I'm very happy to host you here. And uh, as you know, Alianza UC Mexico is the entity within the University of California that has all the uh, cooperation with Mexico. Of course, Casa California is part of it. And I want to thank Ale Brown for, for helping us putting together this webinar. Thank you, Ale, you've been great in helping us putting all of this together. And, uh, and we're going to be with you uh, not only Stefan and I, but also uh, two very important uh, Mexican diplomats in the US. Uh, first of all, my dear friend, Ambassador Liliana Ferrer, the, our general consul in Sacramento. And uh, we all know that we're very well represented in the capital of California because Liliana is there. We're also going to have Ambassador Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, my dear friend, Carlos Gonzalez, and uh, he's a career ambassador as well as, as Liliana. And we're, I mean, very lucky to have him here serving in Tijuana and San Diego. He serves the entire region. Thank you, Carlos, for being here. And we also will have Jose Galicot. Um, he is uh, the inspiration and the leader of Tijuana Innovadora, which is what, what I would say a movement of people to improve the narrative of Tijuana as a place of innovation. Thank you, Jose, for being with us and for being an inspiration so, uh, to a lot of us. Uh, I, I've been in the region only three years, and I know we owe you a lot, Jose. So thank you for being with us. Uh, so let me uh, ask uh, Ambassador Ferrer to introduce formally Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kounalakis, and please, Liliana, the idea is we'll have her to talk about to talk to us for about 10 minutes then we will have a few questions uh to the lieutenant governor and then uh, everybody you could you could see there's a q a button please uh, send your questions we already got some of your questions but we uh, we want to do this as interactive as possible i know lieutenant governor he will be pleased to answer lot, lots of questions so send those your questions again there's the q a button send your questions and we will be answering you. Again, uh, please, Liliana Ferrer, could you introduce uh, Gover Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, please? Well, Rafa, before that, you might mention the trend, the interpretation button. Yes, uh, we're going to have interpretation from English into Spanish. Uh, you just go to the interpretation button and you switch there either into English or into Spanish. And thank you, Mariana Lopez, for being an, our translator. Thank you, Stefano, for reminding me that. Go ahead, Liliana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafael. I couldn't be happier uh, for uh, participating in this uh, very important webinar. And I couldn't be more honored than to uh, present Lieutenant Governor uh, Eleni Kunalakis. Uh, Ambassador Eleni Kunalakis is the first woman Lieutenant Governor. She was sworn in as the 50th Lieutenant Governor of California. This webinar is particularly important because of the role, the role that California is playing uh, internationally, nationally, but in Mexico, uh, California relations. We know that it is a crucial time and a crucial partnership. Uh, she is a native of California, grew up in Sacramento. We know that she was President Obama's ambassador to Hungary. She graduated from the very prestigious UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business in 1992 and then went off to do wonderful things at the US Department of State and also worked for Governor Jerry Brown's uh, administration as uh, the chair of the California Advisory Council. But more recently, as she was elected, she has been a tremendous leader, uh, not only by being uh, the first woman lieutenant governor, but she has also engaged 
uh, uh, in a very important way with women leaders. We know that the California Latino Caucus is the largest Latino caucus in the nation with 29 members, but 16 of them are women. And she holds a very, very close relationship to all of them, particularly the women leadership with Latinas, the Rubio sisters. And with that, I will go on to say that uh, in her recent visit to Mexico, shortly after taking office, we know that Governor Newsom signed an executive order designating Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis to be his representative for international affairs and trade development. She's an expert in trade and development and business and in immigration as well. And she also was named to chair a newly created International Affairs and Trade Development Interagency Committee to coordinate the state government's relations with foreign partners. So California is the fifth economy in the world. The subnational government has its most important relationship with Mexico, so she has said. In her trip to Mexico, she engaged in a very personal and a very human and warm way, but in a very close way to our culture uh, in driving her around to her meetings. She said, wait a minute, I need to stop and get some real Mexican food. And uh, she engaged very graciously with the hosts of the restaurant, a local small uh, a restaurant hole in the wall. And so I can't think of uh, a, 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 a better person to talk about the future of California and Mexico relations than uh, Ambassador Kunalakis, California's top diplomat that she is, placing Mexico again as a top priority and having an understanding, a very understanding from her perspective as a child of Greek immigrants of the enormous contribution uh, that the Mexican population uh, has and does to California's economy. Uh, we've had numerous conversations about how we can, uh, can, uh, how we can recognize and help and protect together essential workers. So with that, Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, for joining us this morning at these very, very complex and busy times for you, given the current circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana, for that gracious introduction. It is always wonderful to be with you, my friend, uh, as well, of course, as the Consul General from San Diego, Consul General Gonzalez Gutierrez. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, it's great to be here uh, with you, Rafael, and um, uh, thank you for the incredible work that you are doing down at University of San Diego, University of California, San Diego. Uh, it's incredibly important. As Liliana mentioned, uh, California considers Mexico to be our most important international partner. Uh, we had our first trade mission of this administration was to Mexico City. We spent five days uh, there uh, reaffirming our commitment to the relationship. And what I thought I would do is just start out by um, talking about why this relationship is so important. Though I know uh, most of you who are on this webinar already know some of these things, um, I'd like to just frame it um, so you understand how we in state government see the importance of this relationship. Of course, it starts with our border. We have a 145 mile border between the state of California and the country of Mexico. This creates extraordinary opportunities and has helped to shape uh, the character of the state of California. Two way trade in 2019 uh, between the state of California and Mexico uh, amounted to more than $74 billion. Most of that was um, over the border through truck traffic and California's commercial land POEs process, process point of entries, excuse me, process more than $65 billion in total bilateral trade via truck. This is uh, enormous for the California economy. In fact, Mexico is the number one destination of California's exports. Uh, we consider California's exports to be an important job creator for the people of California. Very important part of our relationship that we do not take for granted. Uh, in fact, 
We also consider foreign direct investment to be an important part of our economy. And FDI from Mexico provides job opportunities for thousands of Californians. In 2019, Mexican foreign owned firms provided nearly 13,000 jobs across 480 firms, uh, amounting to $1.17 billion in estimated, uh, sorry, million dollars in estimated wages. This is extremely important for the California economy and something that we take seriously and we work to grow and to protect. Uh, we also find that, of course, the uh, relationships, the person-to-person -person relationships have shaped the character of California. Approximately 35% uh, of Californians consider uh, themselves to have uh, uh, Latin American heritage, the majority from Mexico. Um, we are 27% foreign born in the state of California, largely because of immigration from Mexico. And we consider our culture to be enhanced by uh, the relationship, the, the uh, uh, foundational relationship between Mexico and California. We also consider our economy, uh, the fifth largest in the world, to be boosted and enhanced by immigration and by two-way trade and investment. So um, I also want to talk, as Liliana mentioned, a little bit about our visit to Mexico back in October of 2019. As I said, it was our very first foreign mission and uh, it was extremely fruitful. We met with the chief of staff to the president. We met uh, with uh, representatives at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Economy, Minister of Agriculture, the Mayor of Mexico City, our U.S. Ambassador in Mexico City, uh, as well as representatives from Conego, Comexi, CCE, and the AmCham. We brought with us a group of business leaders and members of the California State Legislature uh, we signed MOUs uh, with the CEC, uh, the CEC with Mexico City, the CDFA with the Minister of Agriculture, as well as uh, an MOU signed between the Ministry of Economy and California's uh, GOBIS, the Governor's uh, 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 Office of Business and Economic Development. And then finally, and I see Allard Brown is on this call as well, who runs the Casa de California in Mexico City. We uh, signed an MOU that allowed us to open our very first trade and service desk in Mexico City. So uh, this was, as I said, a very important trip for us and um, is the basis of uh, the foundation that we are working to build to increase cooperation uh, and to increase uh, the ability to continue to develop the close ties that California has with Mexico. Um, I have had several other trips to Mexico, shorter trips. Uh, I have been down to Tijuana twice over the course of the last year and a half. The main focus of which have been the cross-border environmental issues. Um, the pollution crisis in the Tijuana River is something that's very important to us and that is the focus not just here in Sacramento but also in Washington and working closely together with officials in Tijuana and Mexico City to address the pollution there and to find and implement solutions in order to remediate it. Uh, and um, I also wanted to mention the historic reinvigoration and reestablishment of the Commission of the Californias. This was a priority of Governor Gavin Newsom from the moment that he took office and Governors Newsom, Bonilla, and Mendoza on December 4th of last year uh, signed the, uh, uh, the agreement to reopen and reestablish the Commission of the Californias, which has already led uh, to some close cooperation, particularly uh, during the COVID crisis. And then finally, um, I think it's important to note 
the signing and the uh, uh, going into effect of the USMCA. Um, California is impacted disproportionately than other states by USMCA. Uh, we have been very supportive of trade and investment and cooperation between the United States and Mexico uh, for many years. Uh, and during the USMCA process, our congressional delegation led by Speaker Nancy Pelosi worked very, very hard on this agreement to reinforce elements related to, uh, to labor standards, um, as well as enforcement issues and environmental issues uh, that eventually were incorporated into USMCA, which we believe made it a much stronger and better uh, agreement. So we were very pleased to see it go into effect on July 1st. Um, I think that puts me at the end of my sort of 10 minute opening to frame for you a little bit um, how we see the relationship. I know we're going to talk about COVID and, and some of the other issues, um, but I just wanted to be very clear that uh, state government in California takes uh, international engagement seriously. Uh, the Newsom administration um, and our office of the Lieutenant Governor have built uh, a great cooperation to be able to do more, uh, to engage more robustly and to make sure that the interests and the values of the state of California are known and heard around the world. Uh, and that starts with a good relationship and good cooperation with the country of Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis. Uh, this is wonderful, and you were right a little less than 10 minutes, so this is wonderful. Let me uh, start the conversation. I want, I mean, we've been living through the worst pandemic ever in our lives. Uh, could you uh, share your thoughts about California Mexico healthcare cooperation, especially on the border? Let me tell you that I feel very proud to be part of UCSD about the UC system. I know that my university is, is helping a lot. I know my chancellor, uh, Pradeep Koshla, I mean, he, he cares about Mexico. He gets that if Tijuana does well, San Diego does well, and the other way around. So uh, I know that they've been sending personnel to Tijuana hospitals. They've been teleconferencing. There's uh, been quite a few uh, uh, PP equipment sent uh, by, uh, by only that PP equipment that is needed there. So I feel proud of this. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about more in the broad sense of, I mean, what is Sacra how Sacramento sees cooperation, especially in the border area, in terms of healthcare issues? Well, Rafael, um, you're absolutely right. And it isn't just the University of California, San Diego. Really, it's the entire San Diego region. Um, something that I was well aware of even before I took this office, back when I was working uh, with Governor Brown, is that the people of San Diego and the people of Tijuana consider themselves to be one region, one region with um, connections and ties and um, one economic region as well. And so it's not surprising that during a time of crisis that the engagement would become even more robust. So you're correct, uh, the state of California has been um, sending support down to Imperial County as well as uh, uh, San Diego County, um, the University of California, San Diego has been sending doctors uh, down to help uh, give advice and support uh, to doctors down in Tijuana and Mexicali. Uh, we have been monitoring uh, the um, uh, community spread on both sides of the border, working to help educate people about how to be safe during this time of crisis. And uh, the cooperation between the Office of Emergency Services has, again, always been robust um, when it's come to um, a variety of issues related to security. Uh, but the California Department of Public Health has increased their cooperation dramatically as well. Um, this is one community as well as it is one economic region. And uh, there has been a great deal of work 
to attempt to slow the spread of COVID-19, treat people who are infected, uh, and work together to keep the virus um, from spreading even more. Though I think, as everyone knows, this is um, uh, clearly an area for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, there's a lot of essential work that's done down in that region, uh, a lot of food service uh, and food production that is done in the region that allows people to be out of their homes and, and working, uh, creates more opportunities for community spread. Um, and uh, we know that American and dual citizens are going back and forth over the border. When people live in closer quarters and work in closer quarters, the opportunity for community spread is higher. So that, again, coupled with the essential work that's going on, has created a situation that, quite frankly, we have to work together to be able to bring under control and to help those who unfortunately contract the virus and become sick. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, you'll be central in this uh, California, Baja California Corporation. Uh, could you uh, give us a sense, Carlos, of, of how this uh, healthcare corporation is taking place in, in the border? Sure, thank you very much, Rafael. And first of all, thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor, for allowing to have this conversation with you, with your staff. Um, uh, it's been a fascinating time uh, to be Consul General of Mexico here in San Diego. As you know, the border is partially closed since uh, March 21st, and that has represented a lot of uh, challenges. But with regards to the, the health issue, um, and the health challenges, the pandemic challenges, at the risk uh, of saying the obvious, uh, both Baja California and the county of San Diego mostly uh, are, are, are two governments, different levels, that serve, uh, that have to deal with a binational uh, population, but with no control on what happens on the other side of the border in, term, in terms of uh, uh, controlling what the other government do. So it's a significant challenge. This is, this is the, basic of, uh, the basis of um, uh, the high task that on both sides of the border, on the one hand, the county, on the other hand, Baja California, have to deal with, how to serve a binational population that comes back and forth uh, without having full control of whatever happens on the government side, on the other side of the border, obviously. Now, in, in this context, um, uh, Calibaja has always been a model of cooperation. And uh, here in the region exists the US-Mexico Border Health Commission, uh, which by the way, today, is going to be 20 years since its creation. Today is its 20th birthday. The problem for many people here at the border is that uh, the commissioner on the Mexican side works every day with her staff, but there is no US commissioner appointed at the federal level for the last three years. So in the worst possible time, there is no US commissioner at the US-Mexico Border Health Commission. So I wonder, um, to what extent uh, that represents a particular challenge to a subnational government such as California. You have been, Madam Lieutenant Governor Ambassador, you have represented the federal, your federal government on other aspects, but now you, you have the challenge of being the top diplomat, as Liliana was saying, of a subnational government in a very particular context in which you have to fill um, uh, the vacuum sometimes left, as it's in the case of uh, the U.S.-Mexico Border Health Commission, by the federal government. I wonder what thoughts you, ha you might have in terms of, of, of this particular context in which you have to deal with the U.S.-Mexico relations. Well, uh, I, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Kissinger who said that politics stop at the border's edge or at the water's edge. Um, you know, we, we try, again, my background uh, is as a former United States ambassador, and there remains um, quite a bit of um, traditional diplomacy that goes on. Our ambassador in Mexico uh, is someone who we've been 
uh, able to work with very collaboratively and cooperatively. Our Consul General down in Tijuana, again, someone we've uh, had a good cooperation with and are able to work with. Uh, and by and large, during the crisis, um, the, the, the working relationship between the state and federal government has gone on um, fairly well. The challenges, um, to be quite honest, have to do with the messaging at the top. And the reality is that this virus is not behaving in a rational way that we can fully understand or control. So we still have so much we don't know about how easy it is to become infected, how likely it is to become infected, how um, uh, when you manifest symptoms, when a test would show that you're positive if you're positive or positive if you're negative in some cases. Uh, we are um, uh, still working very hard to try to understand um, the nature of community spread, why some people get more sick than others, uh, why, for instance, children don't appear to be uh, affected. And, and so as a result, it makes it very difficult to um, message behavior to people in a concrete way. When you have leadership at the top saying um, or messaging that masks are for, you know, weak, scaredy cats, <laughs> as opposed to recognizing that if there is one thing we know about this virus is that if you put a mask on and you're infected, it's less likely that you're going to shed the virus and infect somebody else. One of the basic things. So here in California, we have, um, the governor has issued an executive order requiring people to wear masks in public. Um, but again, if people are watching certain news channels and hearing from elected officials in Washington or even some here in California saying, oh, it's not necessary, uh, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of, we need to reopen all the businesses and put kids back in school, it confuses people. And what we know is that the main reason that we have had this recent surge that we've had here in California and most states in the country is because people have had a false sense of safety that the coast is clear when it isn't clear at all. So I, I think that is my biggest frustration with the federal government is the signaling around the precautions that we need to take. Um, now, having said that, there is always room to be able to coordinate in a more productive way, in a more efficient way. And again, there are certain uh, things that the CDC could be doing uh, better, but our approach here has been to work as closely with our federal partners as we possibly can in order to be able to make the most of our capabilities and take care of as many people who are infected and try uh, in a, a local level to be able, or at a state level, subnational level, to be able to slow the spread. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you, uh, Lieutenant Go uh, Governor. Uh, Stefano Bertosi, this is your field. Would you like to make a comment about this uh, California-Mexico healthcare cooperation? Well, I, I appreciate what the Lieutenant Governor was saying about the difficulties of doing this as a subnational entity. Um, it is the, the sad fact that Mexico and the U.S. are top five in terms of the worst epidemics in the world. Um, and the U.S. leads by far in terms of the worst epidemic among high-income countries. And that complicates this relationship. It's also complicated by the fact that not only do we have very extensive spread, but in both countries, we have serious limitations on the basic tools of public health for combating the epidemic, in particular, the availability with rapid turnaround of testing. As um, you just open the newspaper and you see that in the US, um, there are places where it's taking two weeks to get the results of a test. Well, two weeks later, the period of infectivity has already passed. 
So, and Mexico, with the exception of Bolivia, is at the very bottom in terms of number of tests done per confirmed cases. So Mexico has, just like the US, a serious problem, even more serious than the US, in terms of availability of testing, which is unfortunately the basic tool that we have to control the spread of the epidemic. So we have two countries wrestling with a really bad problem <clears throat> in which it's not going well. And um, we're leading the world in deaths. Um, for a long time, even though infections in the US were staying fairly flat, the death rate was coming down dramatically. And that reflected of two things. One, that uh, we were getting better and better at treating people with severe infection, thank, thank, thank heavens. And the other is that people were, who were becoming infected were increasingly younger. And I think that reflects the fact that um, you were seeing the relaxing of social distancing and partying and things like that more among young people. But over the last couple of weeks, we now are seeing a rapidly rising death rates as well, uh, which is very concerning. And of course, Mexico has um, uh, <clears throat> continued to have increasing death rates, although the, the uh, vice minister believes that um, it hopefully is peaking. And I, I hope that that's the case. So I think there's lots of opportunity for us to collaborate more. I think that as we solve the testing problem in North America, we solve it for both countries. And that really means in my view, um, learning some lessons from other countries like South Korea, in which the government and the private, the private sector which worked much more closely together to rapidly increase testing capacity and make that available. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, uh, Raphael, well, Raphael, yes, uh, go yes. ahead. Yes, yes, Madam Lieutenant Governor. Yes. Just because we're, we're all here, I'd just like to build a little bit on what Stefano said, uh, because we are grappling right now um, with a very serious turn for the worse in um, community spread in the state of California. Uh, you know, we had flattened the curve very, very effectively with our stay at home order. California was the first state in the country to issue a stay at home order. And we flattened it to somewhere around 4% of community spread. It's, it's hard to tell because the testing uh, back in April was uh, still not, uh, there, there wasn't enough testing going on. But by May, um, we were somewhere between four and four and a half percent infection rate. Um, and we were testing uh, something to the tune of 40 to 50,000 people a day. So while uh, it was um, not an entirely a random sample of Californians, uh, it was fairly broad, broad enough to be able to have a sense of how far the infection and the virus had spread in the state. We went from um, the middle of June uh, at about four and a half percent because it stayed there for quite some time, middle of June until the last few days, we went from a four and a half percent infection rate across the state, relatively random sampling, to seven and a half percent community spread. This is really dramatic. In the course of a couple of days between uh, June 30th and July 2nd, it went from five and a half to six and a half. One point difference in the testing. And now we're testing about 100,000 people a day. So um, we have seen this significant spike. And what we know from our 10,000 trained contact tracers who are calling people and, and again, that the amount of data that they can share with the public is limited for privacy reasons. But we do have a picture of what community spread is looking like in California. And what we found is that people have let their guard down. They seem to have forgotten that this is extremely contagious and extremely deadly and somehow feeling that the coast was clear, that they could get together with their friends in somebody's house, a couple of families together, take off their masks, enjoy each other's company, and that they were safe, but they were not safe. And that these now appear to be the cases that have led to this sharp increase. So testing and tracking has been a huge part of the investment of the state of California. But if people ignore the protocols, the testing and the tracking is simply going to be overwhelmed by the cases. So in the last two days, 
uh, the decision has been taken in California to significantly dial back permitted activity. So we have gone back to the protocols that we had at the beginning of May. We have um, closed non-essential work places. We have closed um, dining inside of restaurants, limiting it again to takeout and outdoor dining. Uh, and we've closed down movie theaters. Of course, last week we closed down all the bars and the places that were able to reopen. Uh, and we have had to dial this back in a very, very serious way. We've also started a major public service announcement uh, uh, program here in California to attempt to break through to people that uh, we are absolutely not out of the woods. And because of some recklessness in June, we are dialing back activity, but we are also paying the price of seeing now 18, 1900 people in ICU, a significant spike, even though, as, as Stefano mentioned so eloquently, we have therapies that are reducing uh, the death rate substantially. So that is uh, just to kind of uh, frame for everyone here uh, where we are in this state um, today in dealing with uh, the resurgence and recurrence of the virus uh, throughout almost every county of the state of California. Thank you, uh, Madam Lieutenant Governor, for that detailed answer. Uh, we all care about this. We, we live in California, and, th and I appreciate that. Uh, the California-Mexico connection is very co complex, so let's move to economics. Uh, it's, it's one of the very important dimensions of, 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 of the California relationship with Mexico and with, and with the Baja Californias. I will ask Jose Galicot to ask a question. Please, Jose Galicot. Your mic, Jose. Could you turn your mic, Pepe? Yes. Yes. Did now, you hear me? Here we go. Thank you, Madam. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear you. It's, you are a very intelligent, very courageous fighting this pandemic. But there is a future. There is a tomorrow. And that tomorrow is going to come when the vaccine is working. And when the vaccine is working and more medicines, we may eventually, by the early day, months of, of next year, will be out of this pandemic or will be living in a, in a better life. But anyway, things have changed in many, many ways. We have a treaty, we have many things, and I, go, I want to point some numbers. Uh, Mexico sells to the United States $400 billion a year. 29% of those are for Texas, 16 for Michigan, and 13 for California. So we should do more in California to increase this relationship that you are already doing, and I, I appreciate, but there is a big partner over there that waiting to work together with, with the United States. And I have to point something else. I have to want to point Tijuana. Tijuana is a power factory, big factory. We sell $60 billion a year, $60 billion a year to all the whole world with very sophisticated items. In, 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 in uh, televisions, we have the largest factory in the world. We have, uh, uh, in, in aerospatial, we have, we are a power force. So California is not working enough with this export because we're, these 60 billion are not for California nor United States, are for all over the world. Since we, come with a new treaty. We come in a very competitive world that China is growing and the United States wants to be in, in a competitive way. We should work together. So Tijuana is there with the 60 billion, but also Mexicali is $30 billion exports of very, also very sophisticated things. So what we can do to do more to work together and to do a better business and to compete in the new world that is coming. Thank you for hearing me. Well, thank you very much, Senor Galico. It is wonderful to meet you by video. Uh, and thank you for everything that you do to improve relations between, between Tijuana region and California. We are grateful. 
Uh, and as you say, there is a tomorrow. And we are very hopeful that that tomorrow is going to come quickly um, by improvements uh, in uh, therapies to treat COVID. And of course, as you said, um, by a vaccine, uh, which I think it's safe to say the greatest minds in the world are working vigorously every day to try to get us uh, to a place that we will have a vaccine. Um, and you're right, this relationship is extremely important, uh, important to business and important to all the people um, who work to support those businesses. Um, you asked what more we can do. I will say that for many, many years, even before I served in this position, the um, uh, efforts to invest in a more streamlined process to move goods across the border has been something that California is, as a state has cared deeply about. But frankly, uh, the Chamber of Commerce in San Diego, the city of San Diego themselves have gotten into the uh, 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 bilateral work of improving the, um, uh, the point of entry facilities there. So um, right now, I think there's a great deal of focus as there should be on Otay Mesa 2 crossing. Um, on the north side of the border, um, the investments are being made in order to be able to open Otay Mesa, uh, Otay Mesa 2 as soon as possible. We are hopeful to see more um, investment, to see our investment matched um, on the Mexico side to improve and to finalize that crossing. So um, that is huge um, in order to be able to have additional capacity to move product quickly um, and minimize the cost of delays of moving products on both sides of the border. Uh, I think it's critical and something that we can work on and work on together. Um, I uh, uh, also, um, uh, think that, um, as I mentioned before, USMCA uh, is very important in order to send the message that um, our bilateral trade relationship is important. And I think that um, continuing to uh, recognize that environmental parity uh, on both sides of the border is something that will continue to create this one region um, uh, 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 sense. So to give you an example, when we were in Mexico City um, and we had members of the legislature with us who represented um, uh, border regions of California, and they said, you know, there's, a, there's an impact that, uh, a psychological impact when you're on the north side of the border and by and large um, see uh, uh, good zoning, good schools, environmental protection. And then you go to the other side of the border and you see less investment in that border community um, by the federal government. And so what we hope to see is more investment by Mexico City into the border regions in order to create more of a sense of parity. And I really do believe that that starts with um, environmental concerns. We have a big problem, I, I think everyone knows, with the Tijuana River. Uh, we um, have to fix this because it is the equivalent of a major open sewer. And we can't fix it on our side of the border by ourselves. Now, USMCA, as part of USMCA, has allocated some significant resources to go and build some water treatment facilities on the California side that will help um, clean runoff from um, the Mexico side of the border into California when there are low or medium flow events. But in the rainy season, when the system is overwhelmed and the, the river is uh, bringing large sums of water over the border, um, it will be pretty, pretty much impossible for us to clean it at that point. And so what we also need to see is investment in the uh, sewer treatment plants and the uh, water treatment infrastructure in Tijuana. And I think this is incredibly important, as I said before, 
um, not just obviously of our interest on our side of the border in order to address this serious um, environmental challenge, but also to see Tijuana lifted up into the modern era when it comes to um, when it comes to the infrastructure that the city and the people of Tijuana deserve. Um, one more thing I, I just like to point out, and that is that California has benefited, uh, the whole country has benefited from stimulus funds. Uh, the HEROES Act, um, uh, sorry, the, um, yeah, the HEROES Act is the first one that Congress passed a few months ago. That has brought much needed funds to small and medium sized businesses um, to help uh, keep companies from having to lay off employees. Nevertheless, we've had significant levels of uh, people filing for unemployment insurance in California. More than 5 million people um, are un on unemployment insurance in our state just since the COVID crisis. Uh, that uh, amount that they're able to collect has been significantly um, augmented uh, uh, and supplemented by a federal contribution, and it is keeping families afloat. Those funds are likely to run out at the end of the month. My apologies, that was the CARES Act. The HEROES Act is uh, the one that the uh, Congress is, is attempting to move forward uh, right now. We are strongly lobbying in favor of the HEROES Act uh, the timeline now uh, to when CARES Act funds um, level off and, and uh, expire is coming up. And uh, so we are very hopeful, but also very um, aggressively and vocally advocating for additional federal funds to help our businesses. And that will uh, be very important to, as I said, small and medium-sized businesses, um, of which many of them are located on the border or do business across uh, the border between California and Mexico. Thank you, uh, Madam Lieutenant Governor. I, I know uh, Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez wants to make a comment and then we'll go uh, uh, to our last topic, which is immigration and essential workers in California. Go ahead, Carlos. Just, I, I would like you to be brief, please. Very brief. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor. I just wanna say regarding the river that um, fortunately kelp is on the way pretty quickly. I want to publicly recognize the actions of another subnational government, Baja California, which has invested in um, a couple of uh, uh, what they call chopper pumps that are being installed right now. There are last two weeks, they are starting to operating uh, next week. They are already in place. And um, on the other hand, the, the commission at the Pebesila, after a long bidding process is about to announce who's gonna be the private contractor managing the, the Pebe Sila. So um, I'm very hopeful that the sewage spills that have been affected us will come uh, to an end in the very immediate future. Things are moving, moving quickly on the Mexican side. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, now, I mean, there's-, is there, there's a, Carlos, there's, is there any update for everyone on Otay Mesa too? Yes, the, the, the federal government announced the right of way um, uh, process, a bidding process to select the negotiator in charge of um, uh, the, the right of ways, El Derecho de Via, the rights of way, purchases of land on the Mexican side. That has been already published in the Diario Oficial, the Federal Register on the Mexican side. So things are moving in that direction as well. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, now, uh, California has been very special uh, regarding uh, Mexican immigrants. Uh, we believe they welcome to California. They're not welcome to some other states, <laughs> but they are welcome to California. I wonder if you could uh, share your thoughts and, uh, uh, and if you could share with us what has been the, the, the special policies under COVID-19 uh, from Sacramento? to the immigrant population. I understand that there's a fund that even uh, undocumented migrants uh, could uh, reclaim. So I wonder if you could um, just uh, uh, let us know, uh, share with us what is what you're you doing regarding these uh, workers. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for that question, Raphael. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've underscored, but I don't know that it could be emphasized enough um, how close Californians feel to our, um, to the extended families between California uh, and Mexico. Uh, you know, there uh, uh, appears, and again, it's hard to, to get exact numbers, but um, it appears as though somewhere between eight and 10% of California's workforce is undocumented. Everybody has family friends uh, who have someone in their family impacted um, by immigration. And these uh, immigration policies of the current federal administration have been absolutely unacceptable to us in this state. So we have been working very hard to do everything that we can. Um, one of uh, the challenges, of course, is that um, the uh, one-time federal stimulus check that people across the country were entitled to of $1,600, if you filed a joint tax return and one, you're a married couple and one of you didn't have a social security number, the US citizen would not get the $1,600 stimulus check. These are the kinds of um, illogical, irrational, mean-spirited policies that we fundamentally reject in the state of California. So we have been doing what we can to try to make up for those policies. One uh, thing that we did very early on is the governor raised $50 million of private funds in order to be able to give some relief for undocumented workers. Uh, that is the Disaster Relief Assistance Project. And it's still going on, though it's getting to the point where the $50 million has almost entirely uh, been dispersed. Uh, and then uh, when it came to signaling around healthcare, we made it absolutely clear that people would not be turned away from our hospitals if they came in and they were affected by COVID-19. Signaling to people that regardless of your immigration status, if you're sick and you need to be in the hospital, you will not be turned away. Same for our testing protocols. Uh, regardless of your immigration status, if you need a test, if you want a test, you can sign up on your county website and go and get one. Within the 2021 budget, uh, we've made some additional, uh, 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 we, we've allocated additional funds. Uh, our community colleges were allocated $10 million for legal services for immigrant students, faculty, uh, and st staff, and 5.8 million for Dreamer Resource Liaisons. Now we've had some good news from the uh, Supreme Court about our Dreamers. Uh, but again, we're talking about a disproportionate number of dreamers in California who were affected by that ruling. No one breathed a deeper sigh of relief from the Supreme Court decision than we did in California, <laughs> where it's estimated that we have about 200,000 dreamers in our state who we care about, who we want to protect, who we know are Californians 100% and Americans in every way other than their documentation. Um, now, in terms of K-12 education, we've also allocated $15 million in our budget. By the way, a budget that's under enormous stress with a $54 billion budget hole, yet we have allocated $15 million for our um, K-12 education for the California Newcomer Education and Wellbeing Project, which will improve uh, the uh, services to refugee and unaccompanied, undocumented minor students' well-being. I've been down on the border. I had the opportunity to go and to visit some of the centers where uh, asylum seekers are being taken care of. Last year, California allocated funds to help support nonprofits that are providing emergency relief to asylum seekers. Uh, this is the kind of thing that typically you would not see at a subnational level, but it really reflects the commitment of Californians to um, 
uh, those who are seeking asylum uh, at our border. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have, um, uh, gosh, uh, just a, a variety of programs. Um, but one of the things that I also want to underscore here is going back to the importance uh, to uh, the functioning of our state of immigrants and also of undocumented immigrants. And that is that when we look at the profile of our essential workforce in this state, it is overwhelmingly people of color and people who uh, are immigrants from Central and South America. We have to recognize that they are on the front lines in so many ways. And in fact, uh, while 39% of California's population is Latino, they account for 55% of infected persons, the highest rate among all ethnic groups. We also um, know tragically that 42% of the fatalities from COVID-19 are Latino. Uh, it is the only, by the way, uh, ethnic group where the infected rate is higher than the death rate. And again, this accounts for the fact that our uh, uh, people of color, particularly uh, Latinx workers, are on the front lines as our essential workers. So uh, this is something, again, that is uh, the basis for our thinking around the importance of our commitment, um, putting our uh, budget priorities, uh, aligning our budget priorities with our values. And so those are some of the programs that we put in place. Thank you very much for your detailed response. Uh, and I'll ask uh, uh, our consul in Sacramento, Lil Liliana Ferrer, would you like to make a comment on this? Uh, of course. I, I just want to start by uh, just recognizing you know, the Mexican government applauds and, and highly recognizes Governor Newsom, the Lieutenant Governor, and the legislature for this historic effort. We know that just like California was the very first one to uh, ask everyone to go home and take care of themselves with COVID-19, it was also the first state, uh, like with many other things, that comes forth with this very important uh, grant of $75 million from the government. And in addition to that, $50 million uh, from philanthropic uh, groups, 70 organizations, and an additional $50 million is being raised. There's about also 500 individuals. So I just want to highlight the philanthropic spirit that Californians engage in that needs to be recognized and applauded. And having said that, also that we have a wonderful a warrior and angel that protects uh, all Californians, like the Lieutenant Governor said in Javier Becerra, uh, who is uh, the Attorney General of California, as we know, and is doing a, a wonderful job protecting what is just and what is right. I, uh, I think the Lieutenant Governor has said it all. Uh, COVID-19, Guia, uh, Listos, California. Uh, it's all here, everything that California has done. We have been working closely with the Governor's Office to distribute this information in agricultural camps particularly. And there's so much more to be done. I know we're running out of time, Rafa. So I just want to end by saying that, uh, in fact, just like the Lieutenant Governor said, these are essential workers. They're more vulnerable because they go out and work. They don't have the luxury of staying at home uh, and taking care of themselves, but they are taking care of us by putting the food on our table every day. Much more, uh, much more potential for collaboration, particularly with the UC. Uh, Stefano and, and Rafael Fernandez de Castro have been doing a wonderful job every Friday with webinars regarding uh, the California-Mexico relation with COVID-19. And here I think with the UC system, I'm a proud alum, uh, just like the, uh, and particularly of UCSD. I graduated from UCSD, so I'm very, very happy uh, to be here. There is much more collaboration that still can be done. Wonderful seeing my colleague, Carlos Gonzalez, who I think were the only two career foreign service officers that have been assigned to what I consider today the most important consulates in the U.S.-Mexico relationship, which are San Diego, Los Angeles, and Sacramento. And, uh, and last but not least, again, thank you, California, for everything you do for our people. Thank you very much. 
As you can tell, we're very proud to have this alum. Uh, she, she was a student of, of, of the School of Global uh, uh, Policy and Strategy, so, so wonderful to have you, uh, Liliana. Uh, Governor, we have, to, we have to finish this. Uh, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, to be continued, uh, as Jose Galicot said, there's a future. So in the future, we would like to host you here in San Diego and in Tijuana. You have already accepted our invitation for, for the border summit that we were putting together. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 crisis uh, uh, made us to, to, to just uh, postpone it. But there will be a future and we would love to have you here. We know that you care about U.S.-Mexican relations, about California-Mexican relations, and we will need you here for that border summit. Uh, would you like to just say some brief uh, closing remarks? And thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you, Alder Brown and Casa California uh, for, for being so helpful. Thank you, Liliana, for your enthusiasm and yours, Carlos, and, uh, and also Jose Galicot and uh, Stefano Bertosi. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Eleni, Konalakis, you have the last few words. And thank you very much for, him, for being with us. Well, let me thank you again for all of the incredible work being done by the people who've been uh, on this panel. Uh, I am a very proud Californian. My father was an immigrant from Greece. Uh, he came and he worked in the fields as a farm worker and made his way through the California State University system uh, and uh, change the trajectory of my family's life. And uh, I've walked this pathway of the California dream that so many, uh, so many immigrants from Mexico to California, so many Mexican Californians, Mexican Americans have also walked. And I think that um, it's clear that the Things that have made California the fifth largest economy in the world are still here. Uh, we are a people with incredible um, uh, can-do attitude, um, innovative ideas, big dreams, and a system of openness uh, and predictability that uh, has allowed us to be the economic powerhouse that we are. And as we come out of this crisis, hopefully minimizing the number of fatalities and people affected by this terrible, terrible sickness, uh, we will come out as strong or stronger than ever. So thank you all. And it uh, was wonderful to be with you virtually. And I look forward to when we can all be together in person. Adios. We'll see you soon. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you.